Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Swapnil Joglika. Let's take a look at the stories for the day. Keshav Mahindra, the former chairman of Mahindra and Mahindra, passed away last week at the age of 99. Under his stewardship, Mahindra and Mahindra Group diversified in automobile, IT, real estate and several other sectors. But his illustrious career was also marked by a rough patch. Keshav Mahindra was sentenced to two years in jail in his 80s. The reason? He was the non-executive chairman of Union Carbide India when a gas leak from its Bhopal plant left thousands dead. In 1984. But should a non executive chairman, one who is not privy to the company's day to day affairs, be held responsible for any lapse? Watch Bashwar Kumar's report to find out. On the night of December 2nd, 1984, over 30 tons of highly toxic gases were accidentally released from the Union Carbide plant in Bhopal. Within hours, over 3,000 people lost their lives. The number of dead was later pegged at 15,000 by various agencies. It came just a month after the deadly anti-Sikh riots in Delhi and nearby areas, making 1984 a particularly bad year for both Indian democracy and industry. The Bhopal plant was owned by US multinational Union Carbide Corporation at the time of the leak. Over a decade later, on June 7, 2010, a Bhopal court sentenced Keshub Mahindra along with six others, to two-year imprisonment. Mahindra, who was the non-executive chairman of Union Carbide India at the time of the gas leak, got bail on July 1st. And about 13 years later, while paying tribute to Mahindra, Maruti Suzuki chairman R.C. Bhargava described his conviction in the case as the biggest challenge he had faced. Shortly after Keshub Mahindra's conviction, HDFC chairman Deepak Parekh had said that if the government cracked down on independent chairmen or directors for lapses they were not directly responsible for, people would refuse to take up such assignments. Parekh had said that this would cost India Inc., which was facing a shortage of independent directors. Referring to Mahindra's case, Parekh had asked how a non-executive chairman could be responsible for a design flaw in the plant. Keshub Mahindra was booked under the same sections as the Managing Director, Executive Director, Works Manager and others directly involved in Union Carbide India's day-to-day -day running. He was charged with the offence of causing death by a rash and negligent act under Section 304A of the Indian Penal Code. The same charge faced by the plant operator who allegedly refused to act promptly despite being informed about the gas leak. His sentence was also the same as that awarded to the other accused. As such, many in India Inc. made the argument in Mahindra's favour that the charges he faced were out of sync with his role as a non-executive chairman. A non-executive chairman's role is unconnected with the day-to-day -day management of the business. Instead, it is concerned with effective management of the board and providing third-party governance. As such, how is this designation defined under the law? Chairman is not a defined term under the Companies Act. What the Articles of Association normally do is to vest the chairman with certain powers regarding conducting meetings of the companies, whether the shareholders' meetings or the board of directors' meetings, he has certain powers. The Companies Act does not explicitly define a non-executive director either. Instead, any director who is not in the whole time employment of the company falls in that category. They are also not involved in day-to-day -day operations. While a non-executive chairman leads the board deliberations, a non-executive director participates. Coming back to the Bhopal gas tragedy case, legal experts said that in its wake, it could be concluded that if a non-executive director was also the company's chairman, he could be held responsible for its wrongdoings due to his participation in discussions held at the board meetings he presided over. So, its merits aside, has the situation changed since the Bhopal gas tragedy case? This reform hasn't taken place to kind of insulate uh, the non-executive chairperson. The, the court has, in, in Sunil Bharti Mittal's case in 2019, has laid down the, princ the principles. So they he should have played an active role. There should be criminal intent. Those are the grounds that are there in that judgment. The court has 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 tried to 
narrow the the limits of prosecution but it's not that it's that that a prosecution can't start what the what the legislature has done is that the onus of proof is actually on the non executive chairman or a director that he was in fact not aware uh, of what was the dealing so it is it, it it is no longer associated or attached to the designation that just because he is a non executive chairman or a director he ought not to know anything the the presumption is he should know everything unless he rebuts by way of an evidence that he was in fact not a party to any decision so that's that's what is very clear now under the new companies act even today indian company law does not really distinguish between executive and non executive directors investors especially overseas ones often prefer to have a board seat in a non executive role to protect their investments so in the spirit of ease of doing business framing specific roles and responsibilities for such posts may be warranted such that merely attending a meeting would not make them liable or responsible if you look at some of the jurisdictions like singapore uh, they have a specific provision which talks about a external professional director and they are actually professionals and they are not uh, required to get into the day to day management we could have some some similar principle and in in today's world when there are so many private equity venture capital investments happening uh, and a lot of people opt to have a non executive director on the board i think it will help if there is some clarity that you know these are non executive directors they are purely there to protect their financial investment this will provide investors foreign and domestic alike with the confidence to take up non executive positions in the boards of indian companies which could benefit from their strategic guidance However, policymakers may not find much public support in relaxing the rules, given that the ghost of the world's worst industrial disaster is yet to be laid to rest in Bhopal. Let us now shift our focus to a piece of good news. Apple, the maker of iPhones and MacBooks, is set to open its first ever stores in India. They'll be in Mumbai and New Delhi. However, there is a catch. Apple has signed a non-compete clause, which means that up to 22 competing brands cannot open their stores in the vicinity. Non-compete clauses are regularly used by brands to advance their business, but are they good for consumers? And what are the compliance challenges? Tushar Verma brings you the answer. The buzz around the opening of an exclusive retail store of your favorite smartphone brand in Mumbai and New Delhi has reached a crescendo. It's a reminiscence of the days when people would queue up outside Apple stores before the launch of new iPhone models. With its first ever stores in India, Apple is committed to growing in the country. One thing, however, will be a miss. Consumers will not spot a single store or even advertisements of other tech majors or competing smartphone brands. Companies like Bose, Dell, Amazon, and even Twitter cannot have their products visible in the vicinity of the Apple store. That's because Apple has signed an exclusive agreement with Reliance Jio World Drive in Mumbai. The agreement will provide exclusive space to Apple with guarantee of no competing business in the vicinity. While such agreements are not uncommon in the country, the tech giant's attempt at banning as many as 22 competing brands near its premises is uncommon. So, can brands create exclusive retail zones in India? These clauses which um, ask for exclusivity under commercial contracts stems from section 26 of section 27 of the indian contract act which basically is a section relating with restraint of trade for commercial contracts this is something which um, has been recently or in the past has been upheld that certain negative covenants uh, are acceptable under section 27 i think a famous case here was uh the gujarat bottling company limited versus coca cola company that is one case which sort of you know spoke a lot about how rest, uh, such clauses or restrictions under commercial contracts if 
and to the extent they're reasonable, should be and can be upheld. In March 2023, American toys company Toys R Us had to shut down its store in Hyderabad within 24 hours of opening. A rival global toys giant reportedly had a store under the same roof where Toys R Us had opened its store. The rival brand had a no-competition clause with the mall owner. Hence, the legal complexity forced Toys R Us to shut down its store. What does this tell us about competition and creation of exclusive retail zones? So if you look at the Indian Competition Act, uh, specifically Section 3 and Section 4, one deals with your anti-competitive agreements and one deals with abuse of dominance. Okay, And both these sections indicate that certain activities which are of an exclusive nature or certain contracts which are of an exclusive nature need to be scrutinized if they are going to have an impact on competition. Okay. Now, if that causes what is called an appreciable adverse effect on competition in that market, then those contracts are deemed anti-competitive. While absence of competition gives brands a better chance to boost sales, the same may also impact consumer choice. Experts believe free market economy should allow all brands to coexist and be driven by the economics of demand and supply. So, what impact, if any, can exclusive retail zones have on consumer choices? If they had a kind of monopolistic and a restrictive, it, it was a restrictive trade practice, if you had the ability to shut out competition from all possible avenues of distribution, then it would be truly anti-competitive. But if it is a, a, a subject only of, of one particular mall or one particular space or one particular media vehicle, then obviously it does not, I mean, it, it, this is a legal question, but from a commonsensical perspective, it does not seem to fall into the restrictive domain. When that power ends up being restrictive and really throttles choice for consumers, uh, that would be a very valid thing to say. The question remains if such exclusive retail zone agreements are beneficial for malls and retail space managers. For example, many of the 22 companies listed as competitors by Apple, such as Hitachi, IBM, Bose, do not deal in either mobile devices or laptops. While many mall owners in India do not prefer exclusive zones, experts say such agreements should not lean towards a monopolistic retail environment. If, say, for example, there is a very popular uh, financial district in a city, okay, and you find all the businesses of a particular type in that financial district. Now, if somebody is prevented an access in that area, which is going to have a significant impact on that person's ability to make money or run its business, you have effectively prevented somebody's access into a particular market. Okay, so that's a black and white case over there. As opposed to that, if there is a bit of an ambiguity, then it, both sides will be able to lay out their arguments why it is impacting them or why it is not actually affecting competition. And it will depend largely on the facts and circumstances of each case. Commercial contracts asking for exclusive retail spaces are fairly common in India. The Indian law has envisaged provisions for the same. However, there are also provisions for authorities to ensure it does not lead to monopoly. As far as consumer choices are concerned, experts believe a standalone exclusive zone does not necessarily impact it. Shares of IT Bellwether Infosys crashed 9% on Monday after the company lowered its revenue growth guidance for FI24 given the uncertain global demand environment. As IT shares remain on a slippery slope, at least in the near term, can they trigger the next leg of market correction? Or are they a contrarian bet from a 12 to 24 month horizon? Nikita Vashisht and Puneet Vadva try to find answers to these questions in our next report. Subpar results by IT Bellwether Infosys and Tata Consultancy Services triggered a slide in IT stocks on Monday. The Nifty IT index ended around 5% lower, dragged by Infosys, Tech Mahindra, HCL Tech and TCS, 
that lost up to 9%. The Nifty 50 index ended the day 0.7% lower. As IT stocks hold around 14% weightage in the Nifty 50 index, with Infosys commanding a weight of around 7% and TCS over 4%, how are analysts interpreting Infosys's and TCS's Q4 performance? And can the next leg of the market correction be triggered by IT stocks? For Q4 FY23, both IT biggies, TCS and Infosys, failed to live up to the street expectation. On a relative basis, TCS has fared better, better than Infosys with reported revenues of USD 7.2 billion in Q4 FI23, up 0.6% Q on Q on a constant currency terms, which was 50 bips uh, below our estimate. While Infosys has delivered surprisingly weak set of numbers, with top line decline by 3.2% sequentially on CC terms, led by unplanned uh, ramp down of project, delaying decision making and some, some one-off revenue impact, including a few client-specific project cancellation. Moreover, Hota believes that IT stocks are likely to underperform in the near term. Uh, we expect IT sector to underperform the border market indices in near term, owing to weak earning outlook for FI24. We maintain our neutral stance on the IT sector. On the technical charts, both Infosys and TCS look weak. While Infosys can slip below the 1,000 rupees mark, down 21% from the current levels, TCS can hit the 2,900 rupees mark, down around 8% from Monday's close. Analysts say investors can bottom fish at these levels in a staggered manner, albeit in a 12 to 24 month horizon. The industry is anticipated to remain to stay choppy for the upcoming quarters, given that the leading IT giants have provided a cautious outlook for the upcoming year. However, over a one to two year time period, the sectors may witness demand constraints easing with tech spending picking up. The order book remains healthy, which will soon be reflected in the top line. The hiring slowdown and the normalizing attrition are expected to improve margins. From an overall market perspective, Sneha Poddar of Motilal Oswal expects FII buying and positive domestic queues to limit market downside, at least for now. FIs have been consistent buyers in the cash segment uh, in the April month so far, which, along with the short covering on the FNO side, has been providing support to the market for the last several days. We believe that the healthy uh, domestic macro data points, along with the hope of the rate pause going ahead by the central banks, should keep the market uptrend positive. While IT stocks may appear as a contrarian bet from a long-term perspective, investors should wait for the other IT heavyweights to announce their results before taking an investment call. On Tuesday, Q4 earnings from India Inc. along with other global queues will sway the markets. The government, meanwhile, is working on the Digital India Bill, which will replace the Information Technology or IT Act of 2000. According to reports, it will introduce changes to the Safe Harbour provision. The government has been of the opinion that social media companies should not get a free pass when it comes to content moderation. But what is a safe harbour? We decode it for you. A safe harbour is a legal provision designed to sidestep legal or regulatory liability in some situations. In the digital world, the safe harbour provision protects the social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter from being held accountable for the content posted on their platform by users. Defined under Section 79 of the IT Act 2000, the safe harbour provision says that an intermediary shall not be liable for any third-party information, data or communication link made available or hosted by him. But if the authorities flag some content online, the platforms have to ensure that it is taken down within a specific time frame. Under the Information Technology Rules 2021, intermediaries must remove unlawful content within 36 hours of receiving an order from a court or government agency. 
However, officials have repeatedly expressed dissatisfaction with the efforts of companies to proactively take down the content. Earlier this year, Twitter filed a case in the Karnataka High Court against Center's order to block 39 accounts on its platform for posting objectionable content. Recently, it argued that blocking of accounts leads to blocking of content that is not even generated. The government, on its part, said that Twitter is a foreign entity and cannot promote the rights of account holders in the absence of relevant legislation in India. The government has been of the view that these platforms must not only remove the content swiftly but also be held accountable for the content posted by non-verified users. For the verified ones, however, the accountability may continue to be with the users. The centre is expected to make the safe harbour provision narrower for the platforms. Reports have suggested that some liability may be fixed on intermediaries and there will not be any exemption on the content posted by the intermediaries. Several countries have passed intermediary liability laws in recent times. In June 2020, France passed the AVIA bill asking social media platforms to remove illegal content within 24 hours of flagging. In Germany, the Network Enforcement Act also mandates the removal of such content within 24 hours. Non-compliance may lead to significant fines. Under the European Union's Digital Services Act, trusted flaggers will work with platforms to identify and remove unlawful content. Nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. In Australia, if the platforms do not remove flagged content expeditiously, they may face fines of up to 10% of their annual turnover per offence. That's all for today. Catch the next episode of The Morning Show tomorrow. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.